This is Louis from Watiai, and here's the last part of this three-part interview with R. Gorodiski, VP of R&D at DID. In this final interview, we'll go over the startup world in generative AI. So stay tuned to learn more about this. I hope you enjoy the interview. Speaking of the the company, what is what is the the company DID, and what does it do? Uh, DID is an Israeli startup, and we are. We were founded in 2017, and we're post uh, round B, a total of around uh, 40 million dollar in funding. Uh, started at the uh, Y Combinator, and uh, also very prestige programs in Israel, uh, with good uh, VCs, the uh, best VCs, and uh, <clears throat> we are sort of in the field of generative AI. I said 2017, so it, we're in the field of generative AI before it was called generative AI. Uh, this term is uh, 2022 old, I think. And what we do in uh, brief is uh, we create videos at scale. And the reason we create videos at scale or allow companies to create videos at scale is because videos are the most engaging media and uh, are used by many, many companies to reach their uh, engagement and then their final goal. Uh, but the problem is creating high quality video content is expensive, tedious, and uh, out of the skill set of uh, many companies and uh, giving them the, the superpower of creating videos at scale allows them to uh, open new use cases and uh, cut costs and accelerate their growth. Uh, specifically, we make videos of uh, AI presenters which is, the mo I think, the most engaging kind of uh, videos. If you would to start over, what would you do to build what you have right now to generate videos and automatically? Uh, so first, uh, a bit about the, the problem that we are solving. So it's a multi-modality problem. Uh, we have the modality of uh, an image which is used as a condition, as a, a way to uh, explicitly tell the model what kind of presenter you want to uh, create. It's uh, also conditioned by text and audio. What do we want the presenter to say? And uh, then we create a video which is again a different modality. So we have text, image, audio and uh, video. And uh, this raises the complexity of the, the problem. Each modality uh, needs to be treated differently and uh, they all need to work uh, collaboratively. So uh, this is the, the, the scope of the problem. And uh, I guess when tackling these kind of uh, problems, the first thing that you should do is uh, do your research. Uh, see what's been done by academia, but also by the industry. If you see something out there, then, then you know it's possible. If you don't see something, then uh, it raises uh, many questions about uh, the feasibility of uh, building such a product. So, but once you see something, even if it's uh, not exactly in the domain that you need, um, you have a good signal that it's possible to, if you put enough effort, if you do the right uh, work, you'll get there. And the time spent that you can uh, uh, spend before reaching something that's working, whether it's a POC or a demo or a MVP, can be short. Yeah. But in industry, this could be the, the end of a startup if you don't reach your goal fast enough. Yeah. So that would be the first step, I think. Hey guys, I'm quickly interrupting this video. I have some cool t-shirts, sweatshirts, and even a jacket that you can see in this video. I hope you like the different designs and feel free to buy it to support the channel or not buy it, it's completely fine. Just leaving a like and commenting is all I need. After doing all this research and finding what works, what doesn't, or like 
what other people do, if you can know mm -hmm. what other people do, how would you then try to to recreate it or apply it yourself? Would you take something, for example, something open source and, and go from there? Or would you try to train something yourself? Or is it too expensive for a startup to train something from scratch? What what would be the, the, the ideal approach? Okay, that's, that's a, a very important question. I think uh, you can't overlook uh, open source because your competition could be relying on this and uh, go past you. So you have to be aware of what's what's the what's the commodity, what you can use off the shelf, and uh, when building a product, it's usually built out of many components. But at the end, you have to be innovative in some way, because otherwise uh, your competition would be the same as you are. Mm. So you have to identify the the, the area in your uh, in your product that uh, the ROI, the return on investment that you would put in research, in development, would get you the farthest. So you identify which area it is that you could uh, improve or uh, build uh, yourself in a better way, such that uh, you'll have a better product. For, um, for example, we build Like there's a lot of components in what I uh, described. Uh, you have to uh, generate speech. You have to understand uh, the speech components. You have to uh, generate uh, the frames of the video. You have to build certain components. Uh, building Some components rely on some uh, 3D rendering tasks. So you have to understand Where do you want to uh, put your focus on? And in DID, we build, we went to the heart of the, the, the problem, which is the generative part, the generative model. And this is something that we build. And uh, it's a proprietary model that uh, we train and put, as you said, a lot of resources in development and in uh, training and GPUs. But some other parts, we, we try to use what's available, whether it's a service by the giants, like a text-to-speech engine from uh, Microsoft or uh, AWS, and uh, or some open source 3D rendering uh, pipeline, like, uh, uh, yeah, there are a few examples of, of this, let's know. So you can't build everything by yourself yeah. and maybe you'll go back to it once you understand that this is the, the next big thing that you can improve, but it's a, it's a puzzle built of, of many pieces. And from all these many pieces, is it always the same, the same piece that is a bottleneck? For example, if you, 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 you look at um, the actual model, like the architecture of the model itself, or the data that you need to train it, or the computation to, to train, the time and compute needed to train it? Like what's the, is there a usual bottleneck or problematic for you in, in, in this space? Uh, so when training a model, you can, uh, most of the time you'll have some sort of baseline and then you want to improve it. Whether this baseline is something working or not working depends if you took it from an open source or built it yourself. Mm. Uh, uh, but uh, you you have some sort of baseline. Now you can make iteration changes and try to improve your results. So this process of iterative uh, progress is very important in uh, experiments and helps you converge. And uh, usually the team or the individual that is able to do the most iterations gets to the best results. So you have to build some kind of uh, efficient way to manage your experiments, to have some sort of an idea, to turn this idea into an experiment and to test your hypothesis and uh, whether it's uh, good or not, and then make it repeat this process and uh, the, the experiment could, could be to 
increase your data set or change the model architecture or change your loss formulation or change the algorithm completely. Um, usually changing the architecture is not what moves the needle uh, the most, especially if you use baseline models. And it's uh, less common now to invent a new architecture. Uh, it's more interesting if you could uh, have a different data set or increase the data set size, but don't increase it by 10%. You have to at least double it or increase it by a large scale. If you just add uh, 10 or 20% more to the data set size, it won't move the needle in a dramatic way. And uh, the, the loss formulation, the objective, is also a place we put a lot of uh, efforts in. It's kind of uh, the way that uh, you train the model. Uh, the architecture, I think, is, is the least uh, significant part. It, it's important to, to fine tune it and check for hyperparams, but usually what moves the needle the most is the data mm. and the, uh, the loss or the, the objective of the training in my experience yeah. and is it regarding the data itself is it more about the quality or the quantity like you, you mentioned double it but would it be could it be better to to remove all the the scrap that you have and reduce it by half by half but it's still produce a much better model uh, definitely the quality is also uh, something very important when you're looking at the data part of a model, uh, you're just as good as your data most of the times, even though there's always noise, the data is always noisy. You can't assume that you train from something completely uh, uh, clean unless you fabricate your data yourself. But then maybe it's not such an interesting problem if you could uh, mimic the data yourself yeah. and you, you mentioned have starting from a baseline and so i assume these baselines as you said they are oftentimes open source and when they are open source the there are some exceptions like stable diffusion that are really powerful open source uh, <laughs> tools but models but most times I would assume it comes from the research or like researchers and labs. And so my question was, since you've been in this field for a while, is that is there a, a discrepancy between the results they show and how you apply it? And then a, a second question would be, does it sometimes or often end up working or are you usually just kind of disregarding research-based models? Uh, definitely not disregarding. Uh, we don't uh, stress over every paper that comes out, but uh, we, we try to notice. And what's more important than a, a single paper is a trend in research. Yeah. Uh, seeing what gains more popularity, for, for instance, uh, diffusion models. Uh, if you look uh, a year ago, you might think that, uh, okay, the, there is a nice paper, but it's kind of slow. But if you follow the trend and see the amount of papers coming out in this topic, you'd see that the, the, the trend is going this way and you it would end up like it did, replacing what was the state of the art generative models before, which were GANs. So uh, following research trends very important and uh, what usually we see is to publish a paper you need uh, to show very promising results on usually a data set or a segment and uh, in, uh, in real world problems usually you need to do some kind of a domain ad adaptation yeah. uh, or increase the robustness so domain adaptation is one of the, the biggest problems that the, the industry is trying to solve because on toy examples, everything works. 
uh, on uh, certain domains it's easier and when you're going to in the wild it it breaks and um, usually you need uh, accuracy of uh, depending on the field but very high accuracy in order to produce a good experience to the user so these are all verticals that uh, we try to improve but research papers usually work they produce nice nice results they just do it on a segment that usually doesn't cover what what you want to do entirely in the product that you're building